Ya ayuhan nasu taqu rabbakum alladhi kalaqakum min nafsin wahida wa kalaqa minha zawjaha wa batha minhuma rijalan kathira wa nisaa wa taqu laha alladhi tasa'aluna bihi wal arham inna allaha kana alaykum raqeema Ya ayuhan ladhina amanu taqu allah wa kuru qawlan sadida yuslah lakum a'amalakum wa yaghfir lakum dhunubahum ومن يطيع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير هدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر امور محدثاته وكل محدثات بدع وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار الحمد لله we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we thank him for guiding us. And whomever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides, no one can misguide. And whomever he allows astray, no one can guide. I bear witness that there is no God except Allah. He is alone with our partners. And Muhammad ibn Abdullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace and blessings be upon him, was a slave and his messenger. Alhamdulillah. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us eyes to see. And we should be thankful for everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given, given us. Which is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is getting at when he says in Surah Al-Rad, Surah number 13, verse number 11. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِقَوْمٍ حَتَّى يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِأَنفُسِهِمْ That Allah will not change, Allah will not alter the condition of a people until they first change or alter the, the conditions of themselves. <coughs> In other words, Allah won't change your good condition your state of ni'mah, your state of being and enjoying the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until you become ungrateful for those blessings. Likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not improve your situation from a situation of stress and hardship to a situation of blessings until you change that which is with yourself. So you change that which is with your heart. Alhamdulillah, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for <coughs> bringing us to another Yawm al -Jumar. And I want to spend a few minutes just scratching the surface of some of the fadila or merits of reciting Surah Al-Kahf, Surah number 18. The chapter called the Cain. Akrajul Akrajul Hakim fil Mustadr fil Mustadriki Mustadraki and Abi Sa'id al Qadri and the Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Anna who called men kara a surat al Kaf fi yom jumaati ada a lahu min al nuri ma bina jumaatain. Imam al Hakim says in his Mustadrak <coughs> that Abu Sa'id al Qudri, the well known companion, said that the Prophet وسلم, said that whoever recites Surah al Kahf, this 18th Surah of the Quran, on Yom al Jumah, well, there will be a light for him between the two Jumas, this Juma and the next Juma. So there's a connection. There's merit between this Surah of the Quran and Yom al -Juma. And Abi Dardai and the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Qala man hafidha ashray ayatin Min awal surah al-kahf 
Usi ma menam teja. It was narrated on the authority of Abu Tarda, who said that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Whoever has memorized ten ayat, ten verses from the beginning of Surah Al-Kahf, will be protected from at-tijab." And this hadith has been related by Imam Muslim in his Sahih. At Dijal, we normally translate as Antichrist. He's the opposite of Isa ibn Umayyah. One of the main character traits of At Dijal is deception. For example, the Prophet وسلم, taught us that. Masih al Antichrist, is going to come with what appears to be fire. And he's going to come with what appears to be water. And the people will go to the water, or what appears to be water, for nourishment, and it will only be going to the fire. And vice versa. Whole chapters of hadith have been dedicated to At-Tijab. In fact, many of us, before we salam out, before we do the taslim at the end of the salat, we make a dua, a supplication. And the last part of that supplica supplication <coughs> is protection from the fitna of Masih at Dijab. Because it's one of the greatest fitnas that the Prophet وسلم, spoke about. At Dijab, had the Sahaba so worried, because see, you have to understand, the Prophet وسلم, spoke about at Dijab as being one of the major signs of the hour, the last day. But you also have to understand that, technically speaking, the last days begin with the Prophet وسلم, up until the last day, the last hour. So in other words, the beginning of the last period of time of humanity began with the Prophet وسلم. So when the Prophet وسلم, is speaking about signs of the last days, the Sahaba understood that some of these things could emerge during their lifetime. To such an extent that he talked about at the Jah so much that the Sahaba were worried that at the Jah will come during their time. And that some of them, some of them he told they won't come during this time. Even check your check your hadith collection. There's usually a chapter, Ibn Sayyad. Ibn Sayyad was a Jew who became Muslim, but he had so many characteristics of at the jail that some of the Sahaba wanted to kill him, like Umar ibn al-Khattab. Because they thought he may be at the jail. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had to remind him that if he was who you think he was, you won't be able to kill him. Because that is for Asa, Jesus, the son of Mary. When he returns, that's his job. So the Sahaba were concerned, worried about this figure called at the jab. And in many hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam informed us that he feared for us. In other words, he was worried about us. Something more than his fear of at And you got to understand, this is shocking 
as much as he spoke about Abdi Jab. They said, what do you fear for us more than Abdi Jab? He said, early about so, evil scholars. And scholars, we think we call scholars for dollars. <coughs> People who give convenient fatwas or just lie on Allah and lie on his messenger for worldly gains. Not concerned with how many people's lives are, are affected by the words that come out of their mouths and the writings that they put in the books. They don't care. Ulama asu. At the jail was such an important thing. Do you know the Sahaba, Tamim al-Dari, radiallahu ta'ala anhu? He obviously, he wasn't always Muslim. But he was on a ship, he was on a journey, and some waves took the ship, and they ended up on an island. And on this island, there was somebody that was chained up, and they had a conversation with him. This person was at the job way back 1400 years ago, chained up. And he asked a certain question, where are you from? Has the final prophet been sent yet? When Tamim al came back to Medina and became Muslim and told the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam this story, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went to the masjid and narrated the story that Tamim al just told him, which is a beautiful and amazing thing when you study Islam, because they call that rewayatul ula al adna, narrating the narration of one who is higher on the authority of one who is lower. Because normally people narrate hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They're lower than the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But in this case, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa who's higher is narrating a hadith on somebody who's lower, a new shahad. And he said, do you see everything that I've told you? And to me, my daughter, he just verified it. This is how awesome. It's not like some hidden secret hadith I'm pulling out on you. So the Sahaba were worried and concerned about at dijab And the Prophet wasallam said, whoever memorizes 10 verses from Surah Al-Kahf, it will be a protection for them from at dijab What is in Surah Al-Kahf? You should be asking yourself. Yes, there's blessings and a reward for reciting the Qur'an without knowing what it means, being oblivious to it. Yes, there's a reward in that. But what? Cousins, what stories are told in Surah Al-Kahf? In Surah Al-Kahf, you find firstly the story of the people of the cave, who the story the surah is named after. People who withdrew from society to avoid the fitting, plural of fitna, tribulation of their age. What's fitna? Usually we say, our kids don't start fitna. We think fitna is just trouble, problems, headache. Fitna, you know, the first time Muslims fought each other, what the disbelievers call the civil war, and it's not what we call it fitna. Because you have Muslims fighting each other, which is obviously haram. But the truth is not clear. It's not black and white. Everybody sees things from a different perspective, and everybody has proofs and evidences. Where does the truth lay at? I don't know. They call it the fitna. The fitna, linguistically speaking, used to refer to the process by which you purify gold. You expose it to intense heat. And the non-gold melts away. And what you have left is the pure gold. Which is exactly what fitna does. When fitna comes, the problem is not the fitna. The problem is how you respond to the fitna. 
Are you going to jump into the fitna with both feet? Are you going to choose the wrong side? Will you be standing when the fitness is over with? When the tribulation is over with and it's done, will you still be Muslim? When the tri fitna, the tribulation is over with, will you still have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Will you still be following the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? This is the age of fitna. Those of you who have been Muslim at least 15 years know that you are hearing and seeing stuff that you yourself never thought that you would hear and see. This is not a regular lecture. I can't ask you to raise your hand, but I can know some of you have been in the deen for a long, long time. Would you have guessed when you became Muslim that there would be so-called Muslims who claim to be homosexual, homosexuals? And not only that, Claim is permissible to marry each other. And then on, on the dash on top of that, have homosexual imams publicly advertising that they are agree with this. Could you imagine this 20, 30 years ago? And what's even more baffling about it, because we have crazy people in Islam from day one. But then there's people confused. Well, I don't know. Is it permissible? Sometimes uh, the outrageous thing is not the thing itself, it's the response, the reaction to the thing. So, in Soul to Calf, you have the story of the people of the cave who withdrew to the cave. And there's a, there's a discussion, or Allah is informing us, in the cave, why people specify how long they were in the cave, they, they speculate how long they were in the cave, how many people plus the dog was in the cave. Everything is not what it seems. In Surah al Kaf, you find in the people of the cave one way to protect yourself from fitna. Because sometimes you just can't see it. Sometimes you can't see it. Sometimes it's not your fault. You can't see it. If you grew up in a nice neighborhood, for example, you didn't grow up around guns and shooting and drugs and all. You didn't grow up around this, this type of stuff. But then you find yourself in a hood one day and you don't know, you're just oblivious and you walk right into a shootout right into a robbery where somebody that has experience and knows even if he's not from that hood he knows, okay, this is the hot block over here it's Friday night, why is nobody over there? Something must be about to go down. Or you see people just stiff, standing around. You're like, oh, it's about to be on. Let's go. Let's go this way. <laughs> you know. Unless you're part of the fitna, you go, oh, we're going over here with them. Likewise, you may not know how to deal with money. You may not know how to see a good thing when it's coming. Somebody that's been knowing how to deal with money, especially if they was brought up in a family like that, is almost instinct. Okay, I'm going to invest in this. No, I'm not going over here. I'm going to put my money over there. I'm like, how do they do that? I got money now. I'll just keep spending it. You don't have the experience they do. Just like they don't know. You don't know how. To, they don't know how to deal with the streets. You don't know how to invest your money. In the same way, if you can relate to that, some people cannot see the fitna. They can't see it. And so one way to protect yourself from the fitna is to remove yourself from it. And we're talking about a global fitna. I'm not talking about some argument or beef or whatever. I'm talking about big fitna. Well, you don't know what's right and what's wrong. That's fitness. 
Surah Al-Kahf. Allah tells us the story of Adam and Iblis. The story is well known. So to Kath, the story of the man with two gardens. He had all that cash. He thought he was all that. All that wealth. Look at my garden. I think I'm better than you. Look at this, all this garden. I have. Look at all this wealth that I have. Soon as he was in his arrogant thought, looking down on somebody who didn't have what he had, Allah destroyed what he had. Because he forgot that Allah is in control. That's a fitna. The wealth and the lack of it is fitna for many people. Many of us are broke. But do you know that there are people in other countries that are literally risking their life to be broke just like you? You don't know what broke is. There are people who, born in the deen, have hundreds of years generation in Islam, but they are ready to give up their deen just to be broke like you. And then why you're rich. But you, you're broke. I have this deen. I've memorized the Quran. My family from X amount of generations, they're Muslim. I'll give it all up just to get what you got. The Prophet sallallahu told us, that every ummah has a fitna. Well, fitna to have the ummah to amal. And the fitna of this my ummah is well. And some of us that have too much, too much of it, and it takes us to hell. And there's some of us that don't have any of it, and we're ready to go to hell again. Surah Al Kahf. What else is in Surah Al Kahf? The story of Musa and Kibbutz. Moses and the man with knowledge that even prophet Moses didn't have. And Musa is one of the big prophets. When Allah informed him that there was a man who had knowledge that he didn't have, what did Musa say? Musa wanted to find this person and learn from him. Sign for us. This is a prophet who's mentioned by name, I didn't say mentioned, I said mentioned by name in the Quran more than the prophet we follow. 74 times by name, Musa. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam four times by name. You know the whole Quran was deal with, revealed to him. The prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is mentioned in the Quran more than Musa. Emphasis on by name. The name Musa is in the Quran more than the name Muhammad is in the Quran. Musa he finds Kidder, the man with knowledge. And he asks to, come, to accompany him. What does he tell him? Verily, you won't be able to be patient. And how can you be patient about the things you don't know nothing about? You know the story. He destroyed the boat. Well, how are you going to destroy this boat? Messing up people's property like that. Everything's not what it looks like. Went to a young boy, killed him. Ah, you gonna kill somebody? And this young boy didn't do anything to anybody? Everything's not what it looks like. Go to a, go to a town that people are very rude and disrespectful, don't even offer the guests any food. There's a wall that's about to come down in the town, in the men's office to build it back up. Musa said, you could have charged him some money. They ain't give us no hospitality, no food. We could have got charged him some money to build the wall up and we could have ate off of that. See, this is the fuck, this is the vision between me and you. I'm going to explain about these things about which you couldn't hold patient about. As for the people whose boat I destroyed, I didn't destroy it all the way, I destroyed it a little bit. There was a tyrant king who was confiscating people's boat. So the king would have just looked over their boat and they would have still had their boat. They could have easily fixed it. As for the boy that I killed, 
He was, a, he was going to be an evil, evil child, an evil son, and his parents were righteous. Now, I know a lot of us have children. And we know the problems we have with children. Don't get no idea. And if you are crazy enough to extract an idea from that, you can. Naeem said, remember Naeem said that, you know, he quoted Sir Cap, I can kill my son because he's foul and I'm righteous. No, I'll do it. And as far as the wall, the, there was two orphans whose parents, righteous parents, left them some treasure that was buried under the wall. I built it back up so when the children can get the wealth when they attain the right age. Story of Musa and Kitha. Nothing is what it looks like. You think you know something, you don't. Vu called a name. The one from two time periods. The one who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the immense power. There's only four people in history that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa told us about who had as much power on this level. And two of them was Muslims and two of them was Catholics. The two that was Muslim was Prophet Sulaiman and this person, Dhu Karnay. And the two that was disbelievers was Fir'aun and Nimrud. Nimrud. And Dhu Karnay, he builds, one, one of many things he does, he builds a barrier between the people in Yajuj and Ma'ajuj, Gog, Gog and Magog. Read Surah al -Kahf. There's a reason why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us that reading this surah and memorizing ayahs from this surah will be a protection for us and a light for us. What happened to the evacuation? Surah Al-Kahf, chapter 3, verse 13. على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ورضي الله تعالى عن سادة التابعين وعلماء العاملين ورحمة الغربة المجتهدين ومقالديهم إلى يوم الدين عما بعد In order to protect yourself during this age of fitr, you have to increase your iman. You have to increase your spirituality. That's the only way you're going to save and protect yourself. That's the only way. Look at the early life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When you try to get something, you be foolish to try to figure out how to do it on your own. Look at people who did it before you. I don't care what you study. I don't care if it's sports. I don't care if it's business or a particular type of business. Even in this dunya, in the music industry. I like watching a lot of documentaries. Every, every mogul who, who I paid attention to if you listen, if you read their words carefully, they always say, I was inspired by such and such. Everybody, there's always an isnad. There's always a change. Not only in hadith, there's always a change. There's always somebody that they pattern themselves after and they put their own touch on it after that. Our pattern is Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And one of the things that he was commanded to do early on, even before he started uh, given dawah openly is to stand in night in prayer. To hajjah, the night prayer. The night prayer is training, is basic training, is push ups, sit ups, and dips for spirituality. That training at night time. Waking up in the middle of the night and doing a total we prayer. You have to strengthen your iman. You have to strengthen your spirituality. Your iman, your faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your belief in the angels, your belief in the prophets. Your belief in the hereafter, your belief in Allah's divine decree, His cover, His His good and His bad. Your belief in His books, His divine books. You have to treat it like a house, not a house that you're renting, a house that you own. Because if you own the house, you know you just can't just move in and just sit there. You got to keep maintaining it. Things are going to break. You have to fix it every. You got to paint the house every now and then. You have to change the outlet every now and then. You have to change the faucet. You have to do. You have to maintain your house. 
It's the same thing with your with your iman, with your faith. You can't just say, okay, well, I'm gonna lie. I know what I know. I'm not going to increase my knowledge by anything. I'm just good. No. You keep studying, studying, and studying. I guarantee you, whatever subject you study, especially when it comes to your faith, you're going to be like, oh, I didn't know that little fine detail before. Alhamdulillah, let me correct myself a little bit. We have to develop this inner, inward. Why? Because as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about them, the non-believers, not about us, he says, يَعْلَمُونَ ظَاهِرًا مِنَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَهُمْ عَنَ الْآثِرَةِ هُمْ غَافِلُونَ They only know the outside appearance of this world while they are heedless of the hair. That's sort of room, sort of 30. They only know the outward. They don't know the inward. The believer, he needs to know the outward and the inward. He needs to know both. We're not just flesh and bones. We're spirit too. And you have to be connected on both levels. <coughs> now we mentioned the Sahaba Abu Sayyid al Qudri. He mentioned in a hadith uh, of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which you can find in Torah. He said, Itaku fi rasatul muqmin, fa inna hu yandru bi nuri lah. He said, Fear or beware of the firasa, the insight, the penetrating insight of the believer because he looks with the light of Allah. Fear the insight of the believer because he looks with the light of Allah. What does that mean? <clears throat> that means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him insight into things that's not apparent to everybody. The example that I always use when I talk about this subject, I'm sure you heard me say it many times before, if you know nothing about carpentry, construction, or anything like that, you walk into a building, you just see some tan walls, some trim, some lights, and some carpet. But the carpenter, he sees it way different than you. He's looking at the texture of the walls, even he sees through the paint. Even though his eyes physically don't see through the paint, he knows whether that wall is sheet rock or plastic. I mean plaster, excuse me. He knows whether there's mortar under there or joint compound, he knows. He doesn't have to open up the wall to know that the, that the house has knob and tube wiring or Romex. He don't have to do that. He has an insight based upon his knowledge. He said, how does he know? Because he's trained in the field. He's opened up plenty of walls before. He knows about when the house was built without having to look it up on the Allegheny County website. He knows when the house was built. Why? Because he can see it. Your both have eyes. Maybe his vision is 2040 and yours is 2020. How can he see that? Because he's not looking with his physical eyes. He's looking with another eye that you don't have. And it's the same way with this spirituality living there during this age of faith. You have to increase your iman. With your faith increasing, it will increase your insight. Do you know Uthman ibn Affan? The great Sahaba. The Sahaba who married two daughters of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's why he's nicknamed Dhur Norain, the possessor of two lights. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told him that, you know, because both of the Prophet's daughters died while they was married to him. See? He married one, she died during the battle of Badr, and he married another one, and she died. <coughs> Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, you know, if I had another daughter to give you, I'd marry her to you. One of the earliest Muslims. One time, after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a man came to him, and he looked at him, and he said, What's wrong with you? You coming to me? You have Zenad written all over your face. Fornication and dope. And the man said, Awahyun Badi or Badi Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I mean, you getting revelation after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Because the, the, the man had just looked at a woman before he came in the house. He probably said, Oh, man, she's bad. Ooh. So I'm like, oh, like so And he said that. I'm like, whoa. How you know what I just saw, what was in my heart? And he said, and Uthman ibn Affan said, uh, Firasa Sadaqah. The true insight, that Firasa. You know, 
know how they women say, well, men are dogs. You know, some, some women say that. A lot of women say that. Do you know, and I know it's from being uh, Wali of sisters, many sisters, like some, sometimes we, we don't recognize it, the sisters recognize it. We literally, in their eyes, start looking like dogs, like <laughs> panting and stuff. This is how we look to them. It's the insight that they have. They know that you're just trying to hit. You quoting all the I ain't to Marshallah, complete half my deed and all that. Who well, what they see? <laughs> That's what they see. <clears throat> it's the insight that Allah is giving them. You're like, what? Well, I'm not doing like that. But that's what they see. So we have to be at insight, penetrating insight, firasa, during these last days. And we especially need this for those of you brothers and sisters looking to get married, because people aren't what they seem. And some, a lot of them may not be consciously trying to deceive you, but just things aren't what they seem. This is the age of fiction. And Muawiyah he said, La hakima illa dhu tajriba. That there's no wisdom except by experience. And you know the beautiful thing about it? Imam Bukhari, and it's Sahih, this is in the book of Adat, the book of Islamic etiquette. He uses that statement in Sahih Bukhari to make a chapter here. And the hadith that follows it, is a believer is not stung in one of the same hole twice. Now you can't trick a believer twice. Why? Because the believer after getting burnt, getting stung, getting bitten one time, his iman should teach him something about that so that's an experiential knowledge that he has. He won't go back to it. He mentions the same statement of Muawiyah and attributes it, attributes it to the prophets of Allah. So we have to have insight during these times. We have to have penetrating insight. Everything is not what it looks like. And a lot of us don't have insight. Now I'm going to stop here. Look at, look at the political moves that a lot of us Muslims are making. Some of us have insight where others of us don't. And a lot of us see... A lot of us say to myself, why, they, why can't they just understand? Why they don't get it? They ain't going to get it, Aki. It's the time of fitting. They're not going to get it. They don't have the fit awesome. Some people have to get burnt <coughs> on their own. They, can't, they won't learn from your mistakes. A lot of us try to pr pr protect our children from making the same mistakes we made. And for most of the time, it's, it's, it's fruitless. You watch people, like, it's power, like you, it hurts you to see your children walking into the same trap that you walked in 20 years ago. But some of them, they just, they just have to run into the wall.